Okay, how are you guys this morning? Um, what questions do you have? So how many solutions does the equation have? Two. If we graph it, the graphs cross twice. So we want to find those two. Because that's what what that does is it puts them together, right? And the places where the green thing crosses are the exact places where the blue and the red, sorry, where the green crosses the x-axis is right below or above where the red and green cross. See if I can zoom out. So right there is right below that. That is right below that. Yeah. Or sorry, this, this one is right below that cross. That's the one we were looking for, where the green was crossing, right? Um, Okay, so we've got two of them we want to solve. So let's just write down, express them quick. I want to solve f of x which is equal to 0 0.55, 0.55 minus x squared minus sine of 3x. I want to solve f of x equals 0. This is the expression we got when we moved everything over to one side. So 0 is on the other side, and that's what we want. So we're going to set this stuff equal to f of x and solve when f of x equals 0. And we do that with Newton's method. So we use x sub n plus 1 equals x sub n minus f of x sub n over f prime x sub n. I'm going to put that into Wolfram alpha. And then we'll use repetition in Wolfram alpha to get an equation, solution. So. Some of you know that the answer key on your calculators like gives you what you just put in, like right. So we're going to kind of use that same idea to make this easier on ourselves. Um, so we're going to set x minus f of x, which is 0.55 minus x to the second minus sine 3x. That's on top divided by f prime, which is minus 2x minus cosine. 3x times 3. We're going to evaluate that at uh, x equals 
So let's look at our graph. Looks like there's uh, one negative root and one positive root. So I'm going to start at maybe negative one because that's pretty close to this negative root and we'll see where we end up. But I want lots of decimal places. So I'm going to start at negative 1.0, one to just a bunch of stuff there. So I get decimal places in Wolfram Alpha. <coughs> Okay, so it returns this result of negative nine, three, eight. So we're gonna put that one in now. Negative 0 0.938851. And I still want more decimal places. So I'm gonna put in more decimal places. Yeah. That multiplication is commutative. It doesn't. Work. Okay, so uh, we're good to two digits right now. Nine, three, six, two, eight, nine, a bunch of stuff. Nine, three, six, two, eight, five. We're getting closer. Nine three six two eight five looks like the the last of it. So we've got the exact same thing twice in a row. So we're probably good to those six decimal places. So we'll go back to the assignment and see if it tells us. Uh, oh, that's I was like, we can't put a whole number solution because there's no whole number solution. But there are two solutions we can put that whole number in. It says five decimal places, so we will go minus 0.93629, because that rounds up to nine. Okay, and then we have to find the other one, and the other one is just a little bit bigger than zero. And zero has this slope that goes down towards that root. So I'm going to put in zero to start with and see what happens. So if I put in zero to start with, let's, we're not going to get lots of decimal places. So we will put in 0, 0.000 and then some stuff. So we get decimals. And it tells me we're at about 183333. So I'll keep my decimals in there. Now I'm at 181179. One one eight two. And we're still at 1182, so two five decimal places were probably good. So we'll put in 0.18118 to five decimal places that'll round down. So let's check that. And we're good. Does that make sense? Anybody have questions about that from online or anything? Okay. Other questions you guys have on this Newton's method stuff? Okay. Let's talk anti-differentiation. So anti-differentiation. Oh. 
Well, it's the opposite of differentiation. So it's it's undoing differentiation. Like inverse functions undo functions. Anti-differentiation undoes differentiation. We can think about things a little bit like if f of x is x to the n, then f prime of x equals n x to the n minus one, right? That's our basic power rule. So to undo this differentiation, um, what was the what was the process? We can just think about it at the process level. Uh, for now, we'll do the actual math behind it uh, in a little bit. But the, at the process level, you brought down the old exponent and multiplied. And then you decrease the exponent by one, right? So to undo that, I should increase the exponent by one and then divide by the new exponent. Yeah. So what f? gives f prime of x equal x to the n. Well, we have to undo the differentiation process. And that's going to say that f of x equals x to the n plus 1 divided by n plus 1. So that when you differentiate this you bring down the n plus one and multiply right and that'll cancel with the denominator and then you decrease the exponent by one and you end up at x to the n okay so that's undoing the product rule we've got a couple other rules um sorry not the product rule the power rule the product rule undoing is a little harder um that's chapter six stuff actually uh, chain rule, we can kind of maybe do some weak substitution stuff, but that's also chapter six stuff. We're just doing the very basic anti-differentiation right now. So what function has sine x as its derivative? Yeah, the negative cosine. If I differentiate the negative cosine, that negative sign sticks around in front, and then it's the negative sign is the derivative of the cosine. So this is sine of x. Okay, so the antiderivative of the sine is the negative cosine. And the other trig functions kind of work that way too. Um, I don't know. Well, we'll do it anyway. This integration symbol can also be met as an anti-differentiation symbol. It's like an elongated S. This means integrate or anti-differentiate. The thing with all of these that I probably should have said was you always get to add a constant to the end because if you take a derivative, the constant disappears. So I should put a constant at the end of any antiderivative that I take. And we always put what variable we're anti-differentiating with respect to at the end as well. So this is kind of a two-part function, right? This is the name of the function, which is integration. This is the argument of the function. And this is the variable, kind of a secondary variable, but it's the variable integrating with respect to. Okay, 
just like f of x, this is the argument. This is the name. Right. The argument is like the input that you put into a function. Okay. Um, so if I wanted to take the antiderivative of x squared uh, plus secant squared x dx, what would you tell me that is? What function gives me a derivative of x squared? x cubed over 3, right? Because we increase the exponent and divide by the new exponent. And what gives me a derivative of the secant? It's the tangent, right? So this is plus the tangent of x. And we always add a plus c because that plus c could have been any constant that you wanted. Could be 3, could be 5, could be negative 50 billion. That's that's how that works. Um, sometimes I want a specific C value. And so if I think about anti differentiation as undoing differentiation. The derivative is what I have, and all that tells me is like which direction to go at any given point in time. That always tells me the slope of the curve at any given point in time. So wherever I start, I can always go the direction that it tells me to go. Um, and that's kind of what the C is. It's, you can pick any starting point, but as long as you go to the direction the derivative tells you, you're going to have the same derivative. If that makes any sense. So if I want a specific starting point, I will get a specific C value. These are called uh, initial value problems. Or boundary value problems. You have a derivative and you have a starting point and you want to know the actual function. So you have a derivative and a function value and you want the actual function. So say f of zero equals three and f prime of x equals uh, x to the minus two um, plus cosine x minus secant tangent what is f How do I undo the derivative giving me x to the minus 2? It's a power rule thing, so I have to increase the exponent by 1. From minus 2, when you increase, you go to minus 1. You divide by the new exponent, so it's x to the minus 1 over minus 1. Which function gives me a derivative, which is the cosine? positive sign which function gives me a derivative which is the negative secant times the tangent negative secant and then i get to add c to it right <clears throat> So we're told that f of zero is equal to three. What happens when you put 
uh, this doesn't work very well because I can't put a zero in here. I couldn't put a zero into the original function, so or into the derivative either. So uh, let's make that at pi. Say that if pi is equal to three. So f of pi is equal to minus one over pi plus the sine of pi minus the secant of pi plus c. And that's supposed to be equal to three. Okay. What's the sine of pi? That's zero secant of pi. Close minus one. Okay, so I've got minus one over pi plus one plus c equals three. So c equals um, three minus one is two, two plus one over pi. So f of x is going to be minus one over x plus the sine of x minus the secant of x uh, plus two plus one over pi. That's what the actual function would be. So that initial value, that value at pi was a, allowed us to figure out what the c is. And this is the only function that does that, right? You pick your starting point and then you always know which direction you're going. You're always gonna have the exact same function. Let's bring another one. Let's try just a regular polynomial. Let's say f of one equals um, seven and f prime of x equals, uh, maybe not just a polynomial, but we'll throw in some fractional exponents and stuff like that in there. Um, x to the negative one plus x to the one half minus, three x to the two fifths plus seven x to the 13 thirds. Let's find f of x. What function gives you a derivative of one over X? Natural log. Even though it looks like I should use my power rule there, the function that gives me the derivative of one over X is the natural log. So I need to remember that one as sort of a special case. Okay. I can still use the power rule on this bit, which I increase the exponent to. three halves, and then I have to divide by three halves. So that's the same thing as multiplying by two thirds. Okay. Plus, I have to increase my exponent to seven fifths. And then I have to divide by seven fifths. So I've got a three, I'm gonna multiply by five over seven. Plus, I have a seven, I have X to the, what's this increased by one? 16 thirds. And then I always add a C. Yeah. Yes, because there's a minus sign out there. So the three is already here, right? From this three. Yeah. And you want to divide by seven fifths. So dividing by seven fifths is the same thing as multiplying by five sevenths. So I'm just multiplying by five sevenths instead of dividing by seven fifths. Yeah. I just haven't yet. 
Same reason. Yeah, I've got the three times the seven over here. So this is the natural log of x plus two thirds x to the three halves minus 15 sevenths x to the seven fifths plus 21 over 16 x to the 16 over three and a constant. I'm told that f of one is equal to seven. So when I put one in here, I should get seven out. One to the three halves is just one. Seven to the seven fifths is just one. One to the 16 thirds is just one. And then I've got my C. What's the natural log of one? Of zero. So I get seven minus two thirds minus 15, uh, plus 15 over seven plus 21 over 16. Sorry, minus 21 over 16 equals C. And we could do that arithmetic, but I'm just going to leave it like that because I don't want to do the arithmetic right now. Okay, what questions do you guys have on any of this anti differentiation stuff so far? Yeah. Yeah, I should put absolute values on there, um, technically. So the idea is one over X is kind of like this piecewise function, right? There's two parts to it. There's the left half part and there's the right half part for one over X. The natural log function only exists on the right half of the plane. But what I want to do is this thing is basically rotated around, right? And this thing still has negative um, slope everywhere here and that type of stuff. Uh, so if I put in the natural log of the absolute value, I now get that entire graph, if that makes any sense. And so because there's this portion on the left half, I need to use both parts for the, for the derivative. So this, this is the antiderivative of this guy, right? This is, yeah, this is the, this is the derivative of ln. Yeah. If I'm in the right half, I can just take the derivative of the natural log of X as one over X, right? This is also, part of derivative of ln natural log x in absolute value. But because I'm on this half, it's sort of going the other way and the slope's negative. This is still one over x. Right. It's just that over here, you've got the minus sign that's in there. So there's this, this relationship. So, um, you do have to be a little bit careful um, in the sense that if you differentiate the natural log of the absolute value, you got to make sure which side that you're dealing with sort of thing. It's like a, it's a piecewise function because of the, the absolute value bit. So 
you, you just kind of have to be aware that this is the picture. Um, a lot of times we just ignore it and we pretend like everything's positive. So we, we just don't even deal with this half of the plane. And that's, that's usually the way that people work with it. But technically, if you want to work with the entire plane, you got to put both pieces together. And uh, it sort of works with um, complex analysis stuff too. Like if I have complex numbers, you can take natural logs of complex numbers, your calculator will do it for you and it'll tell you it's another complex number and that type of stuff. And you can do all this calculus stuff in the complex plane. And this absolute value of X thing sort of gets a little wonky um, because you're talking about different branches of the logarithm in the complex plane. And so when I'm in the negative part, that's a different branch of this logarithm is kind of what, what this deal is. Uh, and a branch means like a different set of solutions to a certain equation, right? Like square roots, there's two different solutions to every square root. Cube roots, there should be three different solutions to every cube root because it's a degree three polynomial and polynomial should be factorable into three linear terms. And so each of those linear terms should give you one of the roots. Well, if you go to the complex plane, you can find all of those solutions. And if, if you always pick the solutions that are next to each other under some sort of nice little perturbation in the original equation, like you just change that if you have x cubed minus seven equals zero. This is gonna solve for the cube root of seven. If I change the seven just a little bit, I can track in the complex plane, there's gonna be a real solution. That's the cube root of seven that we would usually think about. And then there's gonna be two complex solutions here and here on the in the complex plane where this is the imaginary axis and this is the real axis. And so it's gonna be something like minus two plus two i type thing is going to get you somewhere close to seven when you cube it and then minus two minus two i is also going to get you close to about seven when you cube it and so if i change the seven a little bit maybe to like 7.07 .07, this solution will always kind of be in this area this solution will always kind of be in this area and this solution will always be kind of in this area and as i think of this thing as changing I get a different branch of solutions. That's one branch. This is one branch. This is a branch. And the logarithm is the same thing. When I find the positive logarithm, I found like one of these branches. And that's the one that you deal with. So I guess that was maybe a, a, a much longer explanation about why there's two bits there. But that's kind of the actual deeper reasoning is because in the complex plane, there are two roots there. Sort of, sort of idea. Okay. Uh, that might not even have answered your question, but that's what I talked about. Other questions you guys have from some of this stuff? Just go through some of these real quick. So this is just basic anti-differentiation with the power rule. More power rule stuff. There's your one your natural log absolute value. You should put absolute value stuff in. And then it tells us that C equals zero, so you don't have to put the plus C in. Uh, some trig ones. Uh, oh, we should do some e to the x ones. Maybe do these guys. So I'm going to find the antiderivative of e to the 11x. So this is 11 times the variable on e 
usually if I would differentiate this, I would get e to the 11x times 11, right? The chain rule would say multiply by the derivative of the exponent. So if I want to undo that, I should be dividing by 11. So this is equal to e to the 11x still because exponentials don't change what's in the exponent when you differentiate or integrate them. But because I'm integrating, I'm going to divide by 11 from the chain rule instead of multiply by 11. And then I'd get a plus c, but it says c equals 0, so we just kind of ignore that since c equals 0. Uh, Integral e to the minus 6x dx is going to be still e to the minus 6x, but I'm going to divide by minus 6 this time. Integral e to the x over 11 dx, that's going to be e to the x over 11, but I'm going to divide by 1 over 11. Dividing by 1 over 11 is 11 e to the x over 11. You can check if you differentiate this, you will get this, right? If you differentiate this, you will get this. If you differentiate this, you will get that. Um, these are some uh, trig inverse ones, right? You recognize that these are trig inverse ones. So integral 10 square root one minus x squared dx. That constant can stay out front, 10. One over the square root of one minus x squared is the sine inverse it's derivative, right? Plus a constant. Uh, let's do the next one. You're gonna pull that constant out front and ignore it because when you take derivatives, you can kind of ignore constants, same thing with integrals. So all I'm looking at is the derivative of one over one plus x squared, which is tangent inverse of x and a constant. And then this last one's a little bit tricky. So I'm going to rewrite this as 1 over 1 plus 4x squared dx. So this looks like I should have used a chain rule somewhere. And so I probably should have had a 4 hanging out in front of this. Since I don't have a 4 hanging out in front of this, I'm going to put a 4 hanging out in front of this so that it looks like that. This 4 would be from the chain rule when I differentiate the tangent inverse of 4x. So this should be 1 fourth tangent inverse of 4x and a constant. So if it looked like I was going to use the chain rule, make it look even more like it was that you used the chain rule, and then this bit came from the chain rule, this bit needs to be put on my antiderivative. That's sort of a, a weak form of substitution, um, but we'll do substitution completely uh, next week sometime. Um, just power rule stuff. You should have a quadratic here with a constant. More power rule stuff, more power rule stuff. Um, How does it want you to do that? Oh, sorry. We're not anti-differentiating that. We're taking the derivative of that. So good, you guys know how to do that already. Uh, otherwise, I was gonna say, we don't know all the techniques that would allow us to do that. This is easy if after we know after we know some stuff in chapter six, but right now that'd be impossible with the things we know. So that's just take the derivative. Here's an antiderivative. What would I do to take this antiderivative?
when we were taking derivatives, what was one of the first things I always told you to check on? Sorry. If it simplifies, see if you can do algebra to make it simpler. What algebra can I do to make this simpler? Yeah, I'm going to distribute. So instead of x to the minus 6 times x plus 1 dx, I'm going to take the integral of x to the minus 5th plus x to the minus 6 dx. Now I can use the power rule on both of those pieces. So this is x to the minus 4th over minus 4 plus x to the minus 5 over minus 5 plus a constant. That's much easier than trying to figure out how to, well, with differentiation, I'd use a, pro, a product rule, but I don't have any kind of thing like that for anti-differentiation. So yeah, we have to simplify this before we can take the antiderivative. Um, this is just a sine function one where you sort of have to think about the chain rule on that linear function. Uh, just the antiderivative of the secant squared is the tangent. Uh, sort of think about chain rule on the exponentials. We did some of those already. Antiderivatives of sines and cosines, a little bit with the chain rule and that substitution stuff. Um, So this is just some trig manipulation, algebraic substitution, trig substitution. I factor out the minus three and I get one plus tangent squared, which I rewrite as secant squared. And I know what the derivative of the secant squared is. The derivative of the secant squared is just the tangent. So this is gonna be minus three tangent. Does that make sense? Again, we get one of these substitution things. I probably pull off uh, four. I like, wanna add four to both sides. So I'll add and subtract four so that I get uh, minus four plus one times the cotangent squared. So I've got minus four plus the secant squared. So I'm gonna do that one because that's a little bit weird sub. Okay, so it would be nice if this, this I only have the cotangent squared. So to rewrite that as cosecant squared, and I know what the derivative of the antiderivative of cosecant squared is, it would be nice if I had a one in front of this. So I'm gonna do that. To get a one in front of there, I'm gonna add four to this. So I'm gonna add four to that and I get a one plus the cotangent squared of X but I don't want to change anything. So I still have to take away a minus four someplace else. And then I can rewrite this as the cosecant squared of X minus four dx. And this becomes the minus cotangent of X after I take the antiderivative. The derivative of the cotangent of X is minus the cosecant squared. so. The derivative of minus the cotangent is the positive cosecant squared. And then I've got a minus 4x because this really has an x to the 0 on it. Increase the exponent, divide by the new exponent, and then I get a plus t. Kind of good with that. And it is 850. Um, we'll go through some more of these next time. But it's just if you're really familiar with your derivatives, this isn't going to be too bad. So. This will, this will help you solidify some of that derivative stuff that maybe you're a little shaky on, hopefully. I'll see you guys tomorrow.